uh, go on with some quick housekeeping. So the way it's going to work tonight is we're going to have Raj speak for about an hour, after which we're going to have a Q&A, okay? So the Q&A is going to be for around 30 minutes, and uh, you can just raise your hand, and somebody will come to you uh, so that you can ask your question. But I should mention that people online are also allowed to uh, write questions, and we'll collect them uh, here, and, uh, and, and somebody's going to uh, ask them for you uh, in the audience, okay? Good. So going back to... Uh, our speaker tonight. We are absolutely thrilled to have Raj Chetty with us. Um, I'll try to be brief and, and concise in uh, uh, introducing him, and that's no small feat, uh, because his achievements are limitless. The admiration that we have for him as well. Um, so the idea is uh, that Raj has been just uh, one of the uh, youngest tenure professor at Harvard. He's still a professor at Harvard. Uh, I think it was tenure at 29, and there must be a little bit of uh, frustration, though, because I think uh, Larry Summers was uh, 28, right? <laughs> but I think you got your revenge on the John Bates Clark Medal, which you got at 33, and he got much, much later. In any case, uh, his uh, career, his entire career, is a, is a, is a long list of uh, prestigious and, and precocious achievements like this. He's also uh, a MacArthur uh, genius. But more importantly, his research uh, has made extremely similar contributions to the fields of uh, public economics and, and labor economics. I think um, uh, a general thread towards his, his research is to try to really bring the abstract theory of public economics much closer to the data in order to provide a clear and evidence-based uh, policy insights. Uh, and he's done that many times, uh, in particular in the field of optimal taxation or, or social insurance, and, and he's also provided a framework for doing that connection between the theory and the data, thus spurring a, a real empirical revolution uh, in the way data can help answer important uh, policy questions. Um, about 10 years ago, I would say, you founded the uh, Opportunity Insights. Uh, you're still the director of Opportunity Insights. Uh, and the aim was to go even one step further in trying to uh, use data in order to study how we can provide better economic and social opportunities uh, to children from, from all background. Uh, tonight, you are going to speak uh, about, about this uh, to us, uh, in particular about new fascinating aspects of, of this research agenda, uh, where you use extremely granular data in order to shed light on the important role of, of social capital and social connectedness uh, in spurring socio-economic mobility. Without further ado, uh, Raj, we're delighted to have you. The floor is yours. All right, so th uh, thanks so much, Camille, for the very warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be back at LSE. I think it was last year before the pandemic, giving some lectures in this very lecture hall on related issues. So what I'm going to speak about tonight, uh, you can think of it as in the past few years, what we've learned about issues related to social and economic mobility. And it's always a pleasure to, to be back with familiar faces and, and meet new people here in London. So I'm going to talk tonight about how I think the roots of differences in economic opportunity are hyper-local and how we can make changes in our own institutions, in our own communities to improve economic opportunity. But I want to start at a much bigger picture national level uh, by asking about how economic opportunity and prospects for upward mobility have evolved in recent decades in the United States and in the United Kingdom. So let me start with this chart here, uh, which comes from a paper my colleagues and I wrote a few years ago, where we set about to assess the extent to which America lives up to the aspirations in this space where the American dream of upward mobility is well in yeah, that through hard work, any child should have the chance to move up in the intended future relative to where their parents did. So what we did is went back to historical data and using various methods that I won't go into the details of here, tried to construct a simple series measuring the fraction of children who went on to earn more than their parents did, measuring both kids' and parents' incomes in their mid-30s, and adjusting for inflation. And so what you can see here is if you look back the middle of the last century, back, say, in 1940, for kids born in 1940, it was a virtual guarantee that they were going to 
By our estimates, 92% of children born in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. If you look at what has happened over time, you can see that there's been a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for children born uh, in the middle of the 1980s or 1980, uh, who are turning 30 or 35 around now when we're measuring their incomes as adults, it's become essentially a 50-50 shot, a coin flip, as to whether you're going to achieve the American dream. So that's the picture in the United States. Uh, after we wrote that, that paper, there's been uh, quite a bit of research doing similar analyses in other countries, including some very creative and nice work by Jonathan Berman from King's College, who I think is uh, here in the audience this evening. And so what uh, Jonathan did is develop a slight, slightly different methodology to replicate the series that we construct in the US. Uh, let me just try to show the data for the 1980s, which would be helpful. Um, <laughs> I won't. Uh, OK, let's go ahead. Hey. There you go. Perfect. Terrific. <laughs> We're literally revealing the data as we go. Great. So, uh, so uh, you know, this is the series that Jonathan constructs in his paper for the United States, where you can see he gets a set of estimates that look very similar to what we had in our paper. But then what he's able to do is construct similar series for many other countries, given the context here I'm showing the same uh, kind of series for the United Kingdom, where you have data over a more limited period to construct these kinds of statistics. And the basic point I want to make here is the picture you see in the UK looks very similar to the picture you see in the US over the years where you have the same data. So I'm going to show you a number of results in this talk that focus on the United States, because that's where our team has focused, and that's where I think the data are most readily available to study these questions. But at various points, I'll show you parallel analyses in the United Kingdom, and you will see that very much like this picture here, a lot of what I'm telling you about the US, I think, carries over to the UK as well. So motivated by these kinds of trends, in our research and policy group at Harvard Opportunity Insights, which Camille mentioned in the introduction, we're kind of interested in the big picture question of how we can improve economic opportunity, improve children's chances of rising up in light of the types of trends that I just showed you. So of course, we're by no means the first uh, group of people to think about these issues. Scholars in economics, sociology, and many other fields have been interested in issues of social mobility for decades. What is our angle on it? It's to bring to bear the tools of modern, large-scale administrative data, big data, to use the Silicon Valley buzzword, to study these questions. So what does large-scale data allow us to do, as I hope I'll show you in this talk? I think there are two key benefits of it. First, we can disaggregate that national picture that I started out with to look at differences across subgroups, across areas, in a way that I think can be quite informative. And second, using that disaggregation, we can develop a set of quasi-experimental methods and other techniques to start to identify mechanisms and move towards potential policy solutions that might make a difference in increasing upward mobility going forward. The starting point for what I'm going to discuss this evening and a lot of the work uh, that's been done in recent years in this space uh, is that that national picture that I showed you turns out to mask substantial variation across areas in rates of upward mobility. And so what I'm going to do is briefly review that work, which has been out there for some time and I think might be familiar to, to at least some people in the audience, and then turn to focus on what I see as really the central drivers of these differences in economic mobility across areas, focusing in particular on the role of social capital. But first, let me set the stage for that by showing you this map here which illustrates the geography of upward mobility within the United States. Let me first describe how we construct this map and then tell you what I think we learned from it. So what we do here is take data from administrative tax records covering the entire US population. And in particular, we focus in this analysis on 20 million children born between 1978 and 1983 in America, essentially all kids born in the late 70s and early 80s in the United States. The mic is not, OK, is it not on or? Oh, OK, use this, all right. Um, so, uh, so we focus on 20 million children, essentially all children born in the late 70s and early 80s in the United States. And we use data from um, the tax returns to link those children back to their parents uh, and map them back to the place in which they grew up. 
Okay, we then divide the US into 741 different metro and rural areas, what are called commuting zones, aggregations of counties. And in each of those areas, we calculate using the tax data, a very simple measure of upward mobility. We ask what is the average household income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low income families, which we define as families at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution that corresponds to having a household income of about $27,000 a year. So to give you a concrete example, in the Boston metro area where I'm from, kids who grew up there in families making $27,000 a year, on average were making $36,800 when we follow them over time and measure their own incomes using their tax filings when they're in their mid-30s, okay? So we color the map so that blue-green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility and red-orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. If you start by just looking at the scale in the lower right-hand side of this chart, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation in children's chances of rising up in different parts of the US. There are some places, for instance, in the center of the country, take a place like Dubuque, Iowa, for example, where kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year are making 45 or even $50,000 a year on average uh, if they grew up in those areas. So quite a substantial level of upward mobility in a single generation. Yet on the other hand, you have places like Charlotte, North Carolina, where kids starting out in families at the exact same income level in their mid-30s are actually earning less than their parents were on average, 26,300 in Charlotte, which is remarkable if you think about it, given the amount of economic progress, economic growth that's occurred over the past 30 years in America and actually in a place like Charlotte in particular. So, uh, you know, this map, you, you can see for yourself the broad geographic variation, you know, much lower levels of economic mobility in much of the southeastern United States, cities in the industrial Midwest like Cincinnati and Cleveland, higher levels of mobility on the coasts, and so forth. So that's the picture in the U.S. Now, again, uh, people have started to do analogous work in other countries. So here's some nice work done by uh, scholars at the IFS uh, using data, administrative data from the, from the UK, where there, again, some limitations relative to what we were able to do in the US. In particular, you're not able to measure parent incomes directly, so they're looking here at people who are eligible for free school lunches, which is basically a proxy for being low income, and then looking by area at uh, children's incomes in adulthood among the set who were eligible for free school lunch while they were kids. So again, the same kind of measure of upward mobility, here, red colors are places where kids are less likely to rise up, as before, and the yellow, light-colored places are places with higher levels of upward mobility. Again, remember, we're looking at a set of kids who are starting out in families at the same low income level. And so you can see, you know, once again in the UK, and they quantify this systematically in the paper, there's a substantial amount of variation across different parts of the country in, in kids' chance of rising up. You know, the areas near London, places like Oxford uh, and so forth have much higher levels of upward mobility. Much of the northern part of the country, the area surrounding Manchester, for example, has much lower levels of economic mobility. Once again, uh, you can also see you know, quite a bit of variation much more locally. So to zoom in to the area around London, uh, for example, they show in this paper is that the more outlying areas of London have relatively high rates of economic mobility, and the center of the city has particularly low levels of economic mobility, similar to what you see uh, around Manchester. Okay, so point is, you see this in the UK, you see this in a number of other countries, there's a lot of granular variation across places in children's chances of rising up. So naturally, a question of interest that's emerged in this literature after just simply documenting these descriptive facts is why are we seeing the type of variation that I was showing you uh, in this map here going back to the US. You know, I think that's of interest from a scientific perspective because it gives us a new lens to study the determinants of economic mobility rather than just comparing across time periods or across countries where there are numerous differences and it's difficult to figure out exactly what's going on. If you can ask you know, what's different about one part of Iowa, Iowa versus a nearby state or what happens when somebody moves from one place to another, you can start to get a more precise understanding of, of uh, what's going on. And then second, you know, going from that scientific understanding to, to policy, 
If we can start to understand what's driving those differences, we can potentially implement changes in policy in places like Charlotte, North Carolina, say, that could increase upward mobility there and perhaps overall increase uh, rates of mobility in the US as a whole or in the UK as a whole. So motivated by that logic, the way I'm gonna structure this talk is to walk through a series of explanations for what might be driving this variation. You might already have some in your mind and just systematically test as we've done in a series of papers and many others have done as well in recent years, um, you know, what might be uh, going on here. And then towards the end, take those research findings and talk about how uh, we might translate those findings to changes in policy that could increase economic mobility going forward. So a first explanation that economists often think of is that maybe these differences in upward mobility are, are driven by differences in labor markets or the types of jobs available in different areas. So for instance, you know, take the case of Silicon Valley. We all know the tech sector has been booming in the past 30 years. Maybe that's why places you know, in California have relatively high rates of upward mobility. So to assess that systematically, let's do a simple exercise. Um, let's uh, take the data uh, on upward mobility from the map that I just showed you um, and plot that against job growth rates from 1990 to 2010. Uh, the period over which the children in the sample were growing up uh, in those cities for the 30 largest cities in America. And what you can see here is that there's basically no relationship between these two variables. Uh, in particular, you have some cities like Charlotte and Atlanta, uh, which have uh, exceptionally high rates of job growth. They're viewed as the engine of jobs in the Southeast and the United States. They're some of the most rapidly growing cities. If you look at any repeated cross-section measure, you would see average incomes are going up, they're more high-paying jobs, they're more jobs in total. Yet, as you can see in this plot here, they have some of the lowest levels of upward mobility um, in the United States. Charlotte ranks the lowest among the largest American cities in terms of rates of upward mobility for kids who grow up there. So you might ask first, you know, how is it even possible arithmetically that if you look at repeated cross-sections, Charlotte looks like it's improving a lot, but if you follow kids longitudinally who are growing up in that city in low-income families, they don't look like they're doing much better. So the way I think about it is Charlotte and Atlanta basically import talent. Lots of people move to those cities to get high-paying jobs in firms that are growing in those cities, but what we're seeing in the longitudinal data where we can follow kids over time is that that doesn't necessarily translate to benefits for the children who are growing up in those cities themselves. So one very simple implication of this plot is that simply having a stronger labor market, trying to get you know, a big company to be based in your city does not automatically imply that you're gonna have higher levels of upward mobility for your residents. It suggests that you need some sort of deliberate human capital development, equip equipping people with the skills needed to get those high paying jobs uh, in order to actually create more upward mobility. It's not simply about the availability of jobs. So that was a first uh, potential explanation. You know, maybe it's about differences in labor markets, and that doesn't really seem to be what's going on. Let me come back to the big map here and consider a second potential explanation, this time coming not from economics, but from demography. Anyone familiar with the demographic structure of the US would uh, recognize that there's a potential connection to racial differences in this map, right? So in particular, uh, the areas in the red and orange colors tend to be the places with larger African-American populations in the U.S., the Southeast, cities like Detroit, and so on. And so to get at that, what we did next is link the tax records, which do not themselves give you information on race and ethnicity, to census data, which gives you information on everyone's race and ethnicity in the country. And what that allows you to do is construct this pair of maps here, where we can look separately now at measures of upward mobility for black men on the left and white men on the right. Exact same statistics that I've been showing you, conditional on starting out in a low income family, where do you yourself end up in the income distribution? So if you look at these two maps, you know, at first glance, it looks like these two maps have been put on two different color scales, kind of a red orange color scale on the left and a blue green color scale on the right. But in fact, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see that we have not done that. The maps are on the same color scale. 
It's just that there's such an extreme difference in rates of upward mobility between white men and black men in America that it's almost like you're living in two different countries. And put it a bit more precisely, you basically have non-overlapping distributions here, right? So the very best places for upward mobility for white men, uh, sorry, the very best places for upward mobility for black men, a place like Boston, for example, where a black man can expect to go on to earn about $25,000 per year, they have lower levels of upward mobility there than the worst places for white men, a place like Charlotte, North Carolina. So what this shows is, you know, even in the present day United States, there's absolutely no understating the importance of race, importantly, even conditional on class, right? So we're using very precise information from tax returns to look at kids who are growing up in families at the exact same income level, and it's clear that there's still an enormous difference in children's chances of rising up based on the color of their skin. So, you know, race is clearly incredibly important. Now, in understanding the role of race, you might notice that I subset, started to subset the data by gender at the same time that I've started to cut it by race. So we do that for a particular reason. If I now replicate the exact same pair of maps for women, you see a very different picture, black women on the left, white women on the right. Now you see a much more similar spectrum of colors in the map on the left and the map on the right. And more generally, if anything, we find that rates of economic mobility are slightly higher for black women than white women once we control for parental income. So there's a big interaction effect between race and gender. Racial disparities in mobility are particularly concentrated among men. That might make you think about issues related to things like criminal justice, mass incarceration, discrimination in the labor market that affects men in particular, and so on. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it's clear that the interaction between race and gender is extremely important in this context. So I've emphasized that race is an important piece of what's going on here. But I also want to note that even conditional on race, if you look at the map on the right here, there's still an enormous amount of variation across places in children's chances of rising up, okay? And so to dig into that further, you know, we see that race matters, but so does place in a predictive sense. To dig, dig into that further, what we did next is to think about the role of the environments in which children are growing up, not at this level of comparing across metro areas, but zooming in to a much finer geography. So when you think about you know, environment and the neighborhood that might affect your long-term outcomes. Typically, you wouldn't think about it at the level of London or Boston. You would think about the specific neighborhood you live in, the school you go to, and so on. And so just to show you what that data looks like, I'm going to toggle over to this website, uh, the Opportunity Atlas, which you can access yourself, which is basically an interactive version of the maps that I've been showing you. So you can see this website, opportunityatlas.org. And the way this works is very much like a Google map. You can enter in any address you'd like. I'm just going to type in New York here. And we're going to literally zoom in and see this data at a much more granular level. Here, looking at the data in uh, New York City, now census tract by census tract. Every census tract in America has about 4,000 people. So we're looking at these data now really at a neighborhood level. Um, and so you can see, you know, here's Central Park in New York, here's Manhattan, uh, other parts of New York like Queens and the Bronx and so forth. And so, you know, there's a, a lot that you can explore here neighborhood by neighborhood. But in this context, let me just make a very simple point, which is that the spectrum of colors that you're seeing on the map here at this very local level is exactly the same as the spectrum of colors that you were seeing at the national level when we were comparing across metro areas. So what that tells us is you can go two miles down the road in New York City, and it's like you're going from Alabama to Iowa in terms of rates of upward mobility. Those differences in upward mobility, they're not originating uh, you know, by differences across state borders or differences across cities. No, they're actually originating at a hyper-local level where you often see you know, in New York and in many other cities across the United States very sharp differences in rates of economic mobility you know, just across nearby places. And so that suggests that the roots of these differences are not fundamentally, you know, purely about state policies or federal policies. It's something happening most likely at a much more local level. So to figure out, you know, what it is that's happening at a much more local level, let me uh, go back to the slides here and just show you one uh, next step in this analysis, which I'm gonna briefly mention and, and not go into too much detail on,
which is to, to understand, you know, coming back to this map here, how much of the variation that we're seeing you know, across metro areas or at a more local level within New York or other places is driven by uh, the causal effects of place. That is, if I take a given child and put that child in one part of New York versus another part of New York or you know, in Salt Lake City versus Charlotte, that I'm going to see different outcomes for that child versus just selection or sorting. Different types of people live in different places. So that's an age-old question in the social sciences where people have been interested in understanding basically how much environment matters and how much it's just about you know, differences in the type of people who attend different schools or live in different neighborhoods and so forth. And so to show you how in a series of recent studies people have been able to get at this, I'm just gonna quickly uh, show you this snapshot of studies here where using quasi-experimental and experimental methods, again, using large-scale data, in a variety of different settings, people have documented what turns out to be a very robust pattern, which is that if you look at uh, kids, I'm going to start with this first study here that we did in, in the United States with Nathan Hendren in a paper in, in 2018, where we look at kids who move from red-colored areas in the maps that I was showing you to blue-green colored areas, and we basically ask, how do your own outcomes change depending upon the age at which you make that move? And what we show is that earlier you move to a place where people who grew up there from birth have higher levels of upward mobility, the better you yourself do. And if you move after you're in your early 20s, there's basically no gain at all. So in that paper, we you know, discuss the identification assumptions under which this type of variation, where you look at kids moving at different ages, can allow you to identify the causal effects of place. And we show, for example, that if you compare siblings within the same family, so take a family that moves with, say, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old to a place that looks like it has higher levels of upward mobility, the three-year-old starts to do better than the seven-year-old exactly in proportion to that four-year age gap. So through a series of analyses like that, we establish that it looks like neighborhoods really have a strong causal exposure effect, sort of a dosage effect, on kids' long-term outcomes in relation to how long they grow up in a given place. Now, since doing that study you know, quasi-experimentally in the US, there have since been a number of other studies that find basically the same pattern using different research designs, using different data sets. So to give you another example, there's a famous experiment that some of you might be familiar with called the Moving to Opportunity Experiment uh, in the US, which gave people housing vouchers through random assignment to move to lower poverty, higher opportunity areas. Initially, people thought the moving to opportunity experiment didn't really work and had no impact on adults' economic outcomes. We went back to that data and were able to look at kids who moved at younger versus older ages and were able to so show a similar kind of exposure effect where kids who moved at young ages and were exposed for many years to those better environments have better long-term outcomes. Won't spend a ton of time on this, but the, you know, there are other papers, a nice paper by Eric Chin and the AER using public housing demolitions as another source of quasi-experimental variation, showing big gains for younger kids who ended up moving to better neighborhoods uh, relative to older kids. And then in other countries, people have taken this design and documented very similar effects. So you know, there are about 10 such studies at this point, and I think there is a pretty clear consensus in this literature that place really has a significant causal effect through changes in childhood environment on kids' long-term outcomes. OK, so given that, Naturally, the next question of interest and what I want to focus on here is you know, why some places generate much better outcomes than others. So as a first step to get at that, what a, a series of studies have done using the Opportunity Atlas data that I, I just showed is you know, that data is publicly available. Anyone can download it. People have correlated those measures with a variety of different institutional characteristics, other kinds of factors that might predict these differences in economic mobility. And in a, a very rough summary, you know, one could give a seminar on each of these different aspects that people have identified. But as a rough summary, you know, if I were to pick kind of the four strong factors that have been identified as, as strong predictors of these differences in economic mobility, they'd be lower poverty rates. So more mixed income areas tend to generate higher levels of upward mobility. Second, places with more stable family structures, more two-parent families, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Third, as you might expect intuitively, places with better schools, both at the elementary level and access to higher education, 
tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. And then finally, places with greater social capital uh, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So uh, this final factor of social capital is what I'm going to concentrate on in uh, much of the rest of this lecture. Not because I think it's the only thing that matters, but because it turns out, as I will show you, I think it's one of the most important predictors and can actually explain some of these other associations that people have found in prior work. And also because it so happens to be the, the most recent thing that we've been working on and I think is kind of the frontier of, of the types of things people are thinking about in this literature. Okay, so in talking about social capital and economic mobility, when we set about to study these issues, uh, the first question that arises is, you know, what we actually mean by social capital. So people have talked about, as some of you might know, the idea of social capital for more than a century in the social sciences. It's one of the most widely studied concepts across many different fields. But what people have meant by social capital, I think, has been different in different literatures and has not necessarily been uh, precisely measured uh, in a systematic way. So the first thing we did in uh, starting uh, this project was just to try to understand, you know, to def before we measure something and try to analyze its association with mobility, what is it we're actually trying to measure? So we took the prior measures of social capital from the theoretical literature and classified them into three different types of concepts. The first is what I'm going to call connectedness, the extent to which different types of people interact with each other. So this originates in economics with, I think, the classic and influential work of Glenn Lowry, who I understand actually gave this lecture a year ago, um, Pierre Bordeaux in sociology, and a number of others, including my colleague Bob Putnam at Harvard, who really popularized this concept uh, of social capital in his book, Bowling Alone, and a, and a series of other books. So what is the idea of connecting this? You know, if we take two different types of people, say high-income people in the green and low-income people in the orange, to what extent are they friends with each other? Is it that all the low-income people are friends with other low-income people and all the high-income people are friends with high-income people? Or is there interaction across class, class lines? So you can measure connectedness by class, you can measure it by race and principle, you know, by age, by language, in many different dimensions. So that's one set of concepts of social capital. Another way to think about social capital is to think about measures of what you might call cohesiveness, using data directly on the network graph itself without any information on the characteristics or the labels of people. So one way to think about that you know, conceptually is imagine getting rid of the colors here that distinguish high and low income people and just asking what the structure of connections look like. So one of the most famous papers in this context is a paper by James Coleman from the University of Chicago in uh, 1988 where he uh, discusses a concept that he calls clustering, or that's come to be called clustering in networks, the extent to which they're basically triangles in friendships. So if you have two friends, are they in turn friends with each other? And the idea is that if there are many triangles, then the network is highly clustered, it's very cohesive, everyone's friends with everyone, it's maybe a tight-knit community. If it's in contrast that you have one friend over here and another friend over there, and they're just these bilateral friendships, you might think of that as a less tight-knit community. And so there are a series of measures like this that basically take the network graph and measure the extent to which it's fragmented or connected with different types of statistics. And so that's a second class of measures that we consider. And then a final class of measures that we consider are just measures of civic engagement that have nothing to do with network data at all. They're just measures like how much people volunteer, or how much they trust each other. It's not explicitly about networks, okay? And that uh, actually is the set of concepts that Putnam was most focused on uh, in his early work and has been the subject of, of many literatures as well. So what we set about to do is try to measure these uh, uh, concepts of social capital systematically, again, using sort of a big data approach. And so what's a natural way to think about that in the modern era? It's to use social network data, and so we set up a partnership with Meta, the company that operates Facebook, to use uh, Facebook data for uh, the, the US population. So we're gonna use data here on everyone between the ages of 25 and 44 on the Facebook platform in the US, which is about 72 million people. That covers 84% of the US population in that age range, so it's not 
universal like the tax records, but it's pretty close. Um, and we do a bunch of work to make sure that that remaining 16% is not creating various biases and you can look at the papers and I'm happy to address questions on that if, if there's interest. But So we take that data, we then measure these various concepts of social capital and I'm going to start with this first measure that I'm going to call economic connectedness, which is just that, that first type of measure that I was describing, the extent to which low and high income people are connected to each other. So we use a machine learning algorithm, which I won't get into the details of, to measure everyone's income in the Facebook data. And then we look at the extent to which below median income people have above median income friends. So what this map is doing is for every county in the US, it's asking, take the set of below median income people, below median in the national distribution, what fraction of your friends have above median income on the Facebook platform? Red colors here are places where low-income people have fewer high-income friends. There's more disconnection across class lines. Blue colors are places where there's more cross-class interaction. So if you look at this map, it probably strikes you immediately that it looks incredibly similar to the maps of upward mobility from the tax records that I was showing you initially, right? So it's exactly the Midwest that has the highest rates of cross-class interaction. It's the Southeast where it's the lowest. Parts of the coast have higher levels of uh, cross-class interaction and so forth. And so you can, of course, formalize that by just doing a scatter plot of the rates of upward mobility from the tax data versus the economic connectedness measure from the Facebook data. And here, unlike what I showed you with job growth rates, you do see a very strong correlation between these two variables, a correlation of 0.65. And you know, pretty systematically, the places that have higher levels of economic connectedness tend to have higher levels of economic mobility. So this is one of the social capital measures that we construct. Why am I starting, on, uh, starting with this one and focusing on it? We can do the same kind of correlational analysis with many other measures of social capital that we've also released publicly. All of this data is also publicly available. Um, so you can look at measures of connectedness across language lines, by age. You can use, look at these various measures of the cohesiveness of networks, the degree of clustering, the triangles measure that I was talking about, various measures of volunteering and participation in civic organizations and so forth, all of which you can also measure with greater precision in the Facebook data by looking at the groups that people are a part of. And what this plot is showing you is how each of those measures in a univariate sense is correlated with economic mobility. And as you can see, there's a very stark pattern that connectedness measure has a correlation of 0.65 with mobility, which I just showed you in the previous scatter plot. And all of the other measures are basically uncorrelated with economic mobility. So there's one and only one measure of social capital that in a correlational sense matters for economic mobility, and that's this degree of interaction across class lines, which is actually very consistent with Lowry's uh, theory um, from, from many years ago. So uh, that's, uh, again, the, the picture in the, in the US. Now there's starting to be some work at, at early stages doing this once again in other countries. Let me show you, um, you know, just in the past few months, what's now been constructed with Facebook data here in the UK uh, by one of my um, former students, Tom Rudder, who's now doing his PhD at Stanford and, and collaborators. And so this is the same kind of analysis that I just showed you in the Facebook data in the UK, where we're saying among relatively low income users of Facebook in the United Kingdom, what is the average rank, what is the average percentile rank of their friends? Red colors are places where low income people have poorer friends on average. Blue green colors are places where there's more connection across class lines. And once again, you can see that this map mirrors the pattern that we saw for economic mobility in the UK, there's a very strong co correlation, again, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 in the UK between these two measures, just like we saw in the US. So coming back to this plot here, we want to do more now to understand what it is that's driving this very strong correlation, one of the, I think, the strongest correlation that's been identified between economic mobility and any observable factor. What is it that's leading to this relationship? So you can tell a causal story that I think would be quite plausible in light of theories like Lowry's and others. So you know, what might that look like? In places with more economic connectedness, 
if you have more connections to high income folks, it might be directly relevant in terms of things like job referrals or getting internships. We know that many jobs are obtained through, referral, through referrals. If you're connected to more high income people, that may directly give you access to opportunities that increase your own income. But I actually think that there's potentially a more important uh, mechanism, which is that children's aspirations and the kinds of things that they think about doing, career pathways, you know, whether you apply to college, what college to apply to, is heavily influenced possibly by who you're interacting with. If you've never met anyone who's gone to college, uh, maybe you'll never consider applying to college yourself. And that kind of mechanism can also drive this relationship. However, you know, obviously this correlation might not be driven by that kind of causal mechanism. It could be that there are other confounding factors that are leading to this relationship. So for one, it could be that the types of people living in a place like San Francisco are just different from the types of people living in Indianapolis. And maybe they're both more connected across class lines, and they also happen to have higher levels of economic mobility. So it could be a pure sorting story. It could also be that there's some other feature of San Francisco that is leading to a causal effect on economic mobility that is correlated with connectedness. So San Francisco is a very rich city. That's part of the reason that if you're a low-income person, you tend to have more high-income friends if you live in San Francisco. It's just mechanically, you tend to be friends with the people around you. But maybe it's because San Francisco is a rich city, the schools have more funding, you know, there are other resources in general, maybe that's what's driving the higher levels of economic mobility. So let's try to piece that apart. So a first step is to try to deal with the sorting issue by looking at the relationship between the causal effect of these counties on upward mobility and this economic connectedness variable. So again, skipping a little bit of details, which I'm happy to come back to if people are interested, but what we're doing here is taking estimates from prior work where we've estimated the causal effect of putting a child in every county in America using that movers design that I was describing earlier. So the way to think about that is, got 3,000 counties in the United States. So imagine a matrix, 3,000 by 3,000 of all the origins and destinations. So say you've got San Francisco and Boston. I can look at kids who move from San Francisco to Boston at different ages. And using that same approach that I was showing you in those downward sloping graphs, I can see how much better do you do if you move from San Francisco to Boston at age three versus four versus five, and use that to construct a pairwise estimate of the causal effect of growing up in one place versus another. So in principle, you can do that for all of the 3,000 by 3,000 pairs. Now that's a very large and sparse matrix, and so you're gonna run out of power to, to estimate that literally for every cell of that matrix. So what we do in that paper is estimate a vector of 3,000 causal effects, basically assuming that there's a single causal effect of each place, that it's an additive model, basically, and you can use that to generate you know, an estimated causal effect of growing up in San Francisco, in Boston, in New York, et cetera, et cetera. So we take those estimates off the shelf. The key benefit of those estimates is that they are purged in principle of selection. They reflect the causal effect of putting the same kid in, in, in different places and we correlate them with the measure of economic connectedness. And what you can see is that if you grow up in a more connected place, you yourself as a given child have better outcomes as an adult. Okay, so the, the statement that we can make clearly, I think, from this analysis is that growing up in a more economically connected place has a direct causal effect on improving your long-term outcomes. So that deals with one issue, but it doesn't deal with the second issue that I raised, which is that a place like San Francisco We've established that it has a positive causal effect on economic outcomes, but is that because of connectedness itself or because of something else that's correlated with economic connectedness? So to show you how we can get at that, what, uh, I'm gonna work through this plot here, which I think illustrates the logic. We're basically gonna take the set of other main observable factors that people have identified as being key predictors of these differences in economic mobility and ask whether economic connectedness matters above and beyond things like average incomes in an area or levels of poverty and so forth. So to illustrate how we operationalize that, let me first start with this plot where we're gonna plot the Facebook measure of economic connectedness, the share of high-income friends that low-income people have, versus median household income 
where each dot here represents a different zip code in America. So we've released these stat statistics publicly for every zip code in the United States. So the first simple thing you see here, which I think makes sense intuitively, is that there's a clear upward sloping relationship. Places that are richer tend to be places where low-income people have more high-income friends. That just comes back to what I was saying earlier, that mechanically, low-income people in particular tend to make a lot of friends who are geographically proximate to them. So if you live in a richer area, you're going to tend to have more high-income friends. However, note that there's also a lot of dispersion. So even for zip codes at a given level of income, say $50,000, there's some places where low-income people are interacting a lot with high-income people, and there are other places where they're interacting much less. OK, so given that setup, now we come to what I think is really the key point. Let's color these dots by the rates of upward mobility from the Opportunity Atlas tax data, where the red colors, remember, represent places with lower levels of upward mobility, and the blue colors represent places with higher levels of upward mobility. What you see here, I think, is a very clear and striking pattern, which is that if you take any vertical slice of this chart, you can see that if you take a set of zip codes, all of which have household incomes of about $50,000 a year, so they have similar resources in some sense, and you go from a place where the poor are not interacting with the rich to a place where there is a lot of cross-class interaction, you can see that the colors change systematically from red to blue. Rates of upward mobility go up. But if you do the converse exercise and take any horizontal slice of this graph, so take a set of places where the level of cross-class interaction is the same, but some of them are much richer than others, there's basically no change in the colors of the dots as you go from left to right, right? So what is this telling you? This is basically a non-parametric depiction of a two-variable regression, right? It's telling you that uh, economic connectedness matters, even conditioning on levels of income in a given area. And what's more, once you condition on economic connectedness, levels of income or poverty rates, which is the strongest predictor of mobility that people have identified in the past, essentially don't matter, conditional on, on levels of uh, cross-class interaction. So that suggests that it's really the cross-class interaction aspect that seems to be more important than levels of poverty in an area. So we can do that same kind of analysis for other variables as well. Here, I'm just going to show you uh, the regression table for simplicity. Uh, so one famous result in this literature, some of you might have heard of, it's called the Great Gatsby Curve, documented by Miles Korak and popularized by Alan Kruger. The idea that places with more income inequality, as measured by a Gini coefficient, for example, tend to have less mobility across generations. That's a really systematic pattern that's been documented across areas in the US, across countries, and so forth. So we replicate that in column one here. In column two, what we do is then add as a regressor the economic connectedness variable. And what you can see is exactly the same type of pattern that I showed you in that previous plot, which is that connectedness basically explains the link between the Gini coefficient and upward mobility. So places with more inequality tend to be more disconnected across class lines, and in a statistical sense, that fully explains why inequality is linked to mobility. Here's another example of that, another well-known uh, result in this literature from my colleagues David Cutler and Ed Glazer in a paper in the QJE in 1997, shows that places that are more ra racially segregated, places that have larger black populations, tend to have lower levels of upward mobility for both black and white people. Once again, if we control for that connectedness measure, that basically vanishes. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, this connectedness measure, again, explains why racially segregated areas have lower levels of upward mobility. And so you can see, you know, Cutler and Glazer in their paper note that they've established that segregation is extremely harmful for blacks, but they don't have an exact understanding of why this is true. They basically run a bunch of regressions that look like this and can't find a variable that explains why this racial uh, share matters. And what we're seeing here is that this lack of connectedness provides a statistical explanation for this pattern as well. So based on a series of findings like this, my sense is that this connectedness measure, the degree of cross-class interaction, really seems critical in understanding why we're seeing these big differences in children's mobility across areas. So motivated by that, um, what we did next is try to understand why it is that you have higher levels of connectedness in some places relative 
to others. And what, you know, I want to segue towards what that might mean in ter terms of things we can change going forward to increase economic mobility. So first, conceptually, in thinking about this issue, I think it's useful to distinguish between two very different drivers of cross-class interaction or economic connectedness. The first is simply exposure, so just segregation by income. So take the example of two schools, say, uh, where all the high-income kids go to one school and all the low-income kids go to another school. So since you can't be friends with people you never meet, obviously that's going to re result in a very disconnected society by class lines. And that's one potential explanation for the social disconnection by class that we see in many places. But that's not the only possibility. You could also have this situation here, where you have perfectly integrated schools by class, but it's still the case that the high-income friends are fr the high-income kids are friends with each other, and the low-income kids are friends with each other in the same school in the same building. So, we're calling this friending bias, a lack of interaction, conditional on exposure. Distinguishing which of these two things is going on, I think is quite important uh, from a practical perspective. Because if it's about a lack of exposure, then the way we would address that is by tackling segregation. You might think about things like changes in zoning laws, housing vouchers, busing, various policies that people have thought about to integrate cities, integrate schools over the years. But if it's about friending bias, none of that is going to make a difference. You need to understand why people are not interacting across class lines, even when they're in the same room. So <clears throat> the, the power of the social network data is we can make some progress in figuring out which of these two things is going on. And the way we're able to do that is by mapping all of those friendships between the 72 million people and the data back to where they originated. So we're able to t tell where people became friends. Um, you know, did you meet in high school, in college, in a workplace, in a religious group, and so on. Uh, and so we do that, and using that, we're able to construct, and again, publicly release, for every high school, for every college, for every zip code in America, measures of both this friending bias variable and the exposure variable, basically the share of high-income kids in a given school in this plot. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just you know, to give you a sense, there's a lot of dispersion on both dimensions. Some schools that you all here might be familiar with, Berkeley High School is the big public high school near the University of California, Berkeley. Evanston Township High School is the big public high school near Northwestern University. Um, Cambridge Ringe and Latin is near Harvard. All of these are schools that are thought to be pretty diverse. They have, as you can see on the x-axis, a fairly mixed student body. But if you look at, you know, kind of underneath the hood in the Facebook data and look at friending patterns, those schools have a tremendous amount of friending bias, where the low-income kids tend to be friends with each other and the high-income kids tend to be friends with each other. So in some sense, you know, they're integrated in a superficial way, but in an actual interaction sense, they're not particularly integrated. So friending bias seems quite important in that context. So using these kinds of data, these estimates of friending bias for every school, every neighborhood, and so on, we can go back to the question of overall in the big picture in the nation as a whole, how much of the social disconnection between low and high income people is driven by exposure versus friending bias? And the answer turns out that it's basically 50-50, right? So half of the disconnection could be eliminated by addressing the fact that rich and poor people live in different neighborhoods, go to different schools, go to different colleges, and so on. But the remaining half is due to friending bias. Um, and so what that suggests is we need to think hard about how to address friending bias in addition to addressing these issues of exposure that we've spent a lot of time on historically. So I want to make one final point on this, which is, you know, you might think exposure, that's something that we can change through policy. Friending bias, maybe that's just something intrinsic about people's preferences that's very hard to change. That is not my view after looking at these data. And let me give you a couple of examples that I think point in that direction. So the first thing you can do is ask how the degree of friending bias varies across the settings where people make friends. And it turns out there's some pretty systematic variation. People are much more likely to self-segregate by class lines uh, in their neighborhoods, in their colleges, and so on. But if you look on the far right, you look at friendships made in recreational groups or in religious groups, you see very little friending bias there, you know, basically zero. People are essentially sampling randomly from the set of people in their church or in their synagogue. So the very same person 
makes very different types of friends in one setting versus another, which suggests that the setting matters. This is not just something intrinsic that never changes. Here's another example, maybe something even more directly relevant to policy. So if you look at the size of schools or the size of groups more generally, you see a very systematic pattern that bigger groups tend to have more friending bias. In large high schools, there's more separation across class lines. In small schools, there's more connection uh, across class lines, which I think is intuitive if you just think about you know, going to a party with hundreds of people, you'll probably gravitate towards people like you or people you knew. If there were 10 people, you'll probably interact with everybody you know, by the end of the evening. That kind of phenomenon really plays out on scale and maybe has implications in terms of how you want to structure the size of cohorts, the size of schools, and so forth. And so in that vein, in the remaining few minutes here before we open it up to questions and look forward to the discussion, um, I want to say a little bit about how I think these kinds of research findings can help us think about how to increase upward mobility going forward and show you how we're organizing our thinking and our team on those issues. So in particular, we're thinking about three different areas of intervention that I think follow naturally from the set of research findings that I've just shared. So in a nutshell, what I think we've learned from many people's work over the past five or 10 years on these issues is that the roots of economic opportunity are hyper-local. They depend upon childhood environment, and they depend upon things like who you're connected to, and so on. So if you take that view, I think you naturally think about three different directions to pursue to increase mobility. The first is to reduce segregation. So if we know that two miles down the road in New York, there are better opportunities for low-income kids, maybe we can just help more kids move to those higher opportunity areas. So that's one possibility. Now, obviously, that's not a completely scalable approach. You can't move everyone. Not everyone wants to move. You'd worry about general equilibrium effects and so on. So that leads to the second approach. If we've identified that some places have much lower levels of mobility, how can we make place-based investments to turn those low opportunity places into higher opportunity areas? Second, I think, valuable direction to think about. And then finally, you know, recognizing that after age 18, the key touch point for most kids is not the neighborhood in which they're growing up, but the college that they're attending. I think that there's a lot we can do in institutions of higher education to amplify the impacts of colleges on upward mobility. And as you'll see in all of these domains, I think the idea that social capital really matters for people's outcomes is, turns out to be important in explaining the types of interventions that work. So let me spend a couple of minutes on each of these uh, and then conclude. So I'll start with the reducing segregation approach and give you a concrete example of the type of work that we and others are, are doing in that space. So here's a snapshot of the Opportunity Atlas data, this time from Seattle rather than New York, where you see that same familiar checkered pattern with higher rates of mobility in some places relative to others. What we've done here is overlaid in the bright green dots the most common places where people receiving housing vouchers from the federal government currently live. As a bit of institutional background, in the US, we spend about $45 billion per year on affordable housing programs that are intended to give ac people access to better neighborhoods where they might have prospects of escaping poverty and so forth. Now, what you can see here is despite the fact that these people are receiving about $1,500 a month of rental assistance from the government, I notice a puzzling pattern, which is that those green dots are concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the map rather than the blue-green colored parts of the map, where we've established that kids would do much better in the long run. So when we first put out this data, a number of housing authorities noticed this pattern, and the Housing and Urban Development Agency you know, contacted us and said, you know, can we try to understand what's going on here? Is this about differences in people's preferences? Is this about some sort of barriers that they're facing that are preventing them from moving to opportunity? Can we try to figure, the, figure that out? And so what we ended up doing is setting up uh, an experiment uh, in Seattle, a, a pilot study basically, we call Creating Moves to Opportunity, which was a randomized trial involving 1,000 families in Seattle who came in to apply for a housing voucher. Um, and what we did is basically provided some social support to families to move to higher opportunity areas if they wanted to do so. So nobody was forced to move to a higher opportunity area. Everybody had the same financial resources could do whatever they wanted. But we said, you know, if you want to move to a higher opportunity place, uh, we're going to help you find a unit in that area. We'll connect you with a counselor who will look up listings for you. Um, 
and connect you with the landlord, advocate for you with landlords, provide you with a little bit of liquidity to pay an application fee or a security deposit if you might need that. Basically try to eliminate some of the frictions that might be relevant in preventing people from moving to these higher opportunity places. And so run as a randomized trial, we can evaluate you know, what happened by just following families over time. And you can see that in the control group, consistent with the map that I just showed you with the green dots, only 14% of families moved to high opportunity areas as measured by the Opportunity Atlas data. You know, something like being in the top third of the distribution in terms of economic mobility in Seattle. Whereas in the treatment group, that number jumps up to 55%. And so in thinking about this program, you know, what I want to emphasize is that the cost of the program, the cost of these services was about $2,500 per family, which is not a small amount, but it is a small amount relative to two other benchmarks. First, on average, these vouchers cost about $100,000 per family because it's rent that you're paying month after month for many years. So it's about a 2% incremental program cost. But second, and I think more importantly, we estimate based on our prior work that on average, the kids who got lucky and ended up in the treatment group are going to earn about $200,000 more over their lifetimes relative to kids in the control group. And so as a kind of rate of return on that $2,000 investment, it's incredibly high and in fact would more than pay for itself in terms of increased tax revenues and so forth. So our sense is this kind of intervention can be quite effective. Now, there's a question of, you know, why does this work? Or you, what are the frictions that families are facing? What is it that's, that's driving this program impact? So we ran a second phase of experiments uh, where we broke up that intervention, which had a bundle of treatments, into its constituent parts. So there was one arm where we just gave people the information about where the high opportunity areas are and gave them the financial support to move to those places, like the security deposits and so on. There was another arm where we provided what we call partial support, not the customized counseling where we're gonna text you when we find a new listing and drive you over there and talk to the landlord and so on, but something a bit more broad brush. And then the full customized support. And what you can see very clearly here is that it's really the customized support that delivers the big treatment effects. Just giving people information, just giving people resources doesn't really do anything. And so I think the broader message, you know, I'm focusing on this in the context of housing vouchers, but there's a broader lesson, I think, for economic choice models and thinking about uh, the design of programs, which is I think we focus a lot in economics on providing resources. They, often the de policy debate is about how many dollars should we spend on the housing voucher program. But what this shows, I think, is that thinking about that social capital sort of dimension of providing the support to people to actually make effective choices with those resources turns out to be incredibly uh, important in making the money that we're spending more effective. So uh, just to show, you know, in particular for the students here, that this type of work is not just of academic interest, but actually matters for something in the world at, at, the, at the end of the day, just to show you how this is evolving in the US. So there was, after we did that work, a bill passed in Congress with bipartisan support in the US uh, to authorize about $80 million of funding to replicate what we did in Seattle and nine other cities across America. That is currently happening uh, in the field. But much more importantly, there's now another bill that's uh, been proposed to, uh, again, with bipartisan sponsors, and people think there's a good chance it'll pass, to expand the housing voucher program by $5 billion per year. And importantly, I think it aligns quite closely with the research findings, which I just want to highlight, you know, even in this polarized, uh, politically polarized environment, that research and evidence of the type lots of people here are doing still has great relevance. Uh, you know, you could see they call for an additional 500,000 housing vouchers focused on families with kids under age six. So that's motivated by that dosage evidence that I was talking about at the beginning. With access to counseling and case management services coming from the Seattle study that I uh, just described. And then engaging new landlords in the voucher program given other experimental evidence that the connections to the landlords are really critical. So this is one example of how I think we can use these data to make existing programs far more effective in increasing economic mobility. So in the last couple of minutes here, you know, I just want to touch on the other domains uh, because I don't want to leave the impression that we think moving to opportunity is the only or really even the primary approach that we should be taking to increasing economic mobility. 
Obviously, from an economic perspective, we would worry about general equilibrium considerations if we were to scale this up dramatically. And so I want to say a little bit about the other approaches where, to be frank, I think our current body of knowledge is much less developed. And so as you will see, what I'm able to present in terms of what we can do in these domains is, is just much thinner. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do good work going forward and understanding how we can make progress in these other areas. So let me give you an example in the place-based investment context of how I think uh, we, can, we can make a difference. So I'll give you a concrete example in terms of what happened in the context of this work against in the, in the policy domain. So I mentioned Charlotte earlier in the, the, near the beginning of this talk as one of the places with the lowest levels of upward mobility. When we put out that data publicly, you know, the local newspaper had an article about that, lamenting the fact that this is a wake-up call for Charlotte. We're not really a land of opportunity. How could we be such a terrible place for low-income kids and so on? And so a number of things happened as a result. They set up a task force and a commission to try to look into this, to try to make policy changes, changed a bunch of things in terms of zoning laws, housing policy, and so forth. But I want to highlight something else, which I think is an interesting way to think about place-based policies. So Bank of America, which is one of the biggest banks in the United States, is headquartered in Charlotte. And so they announced an initiative to hire 1,000 people who grew up in disadvantaged communities in Charlotte because they started to recognize that we thought we're bringing a lot of jobs to Charlotte, but actually we're not helping anybody in the local communities. So we're going to try to hire folks who grew up in low-income families in the city. But they recognized that there was a reason that they weren't hiring those people to begin with because they didn't quite have the skills necessary to get the jobs that they were advertising. So they teamed up with a sectoral job training provider called Year Up, which provides a one-year program that equips people with specific technical skills, but importantly, connected to what I was saying earlier, also provides kind of a social capital intervention connecting people to specific employers, providing mentoring, trying to give you kind of the wraparound support in order to be able to succeed in these jobs. So we can look at the impacts of this sort of program going back to historical data where there was a randomized trial conducted of this year up job training program. And you can compare people who were randomized into the treatment group shown in the green with people not in the, in the control group in the orange, just follow their earnings over time using tax records. And you can see very clearly that after you participate in the program, there's about a 35% increase in earnings that is sustained over many years. And again, to connect back to the social capital theme, I want to emphasize, as many of you probably know, there's a long literature on job training programs going back to the 80s and 90s, many of which you, know, you don't find these kinds of effects. You find that they're not very effective. But there's a new wave of these programs that, in my view, basically incorporate a social capital network sort of element that have proven to be far more successful. So again, mirroring the type of thing that we were seeing in the housing domain. Now, this is obviously not the only place-based approach that one can take to improving economic opportunity. You know, targeting particular neighborhoods and trying to provide these kinds of job training programs. I think there are many other things one can do in schools and other types of interventions. And I think there's more to be learned on exactly what is most effective. Let me end by just saying a quick word, especially given the setting that we're in, about the role of higher education. So just like our team has uh, released estimates of economic mobility for every neighborhood in the United States, we've also done that for every college in America. So um, here, every dot represents a different college in the United States. And when you think about colleges, there are two dimensions that matter for a college's contribution to economic mobility. One is what we're calling the upward mobility rate on the y-axis here. So it's just a measure of what fraction of kids who start out in low-income families end up reaching, say, the top 20% of the income distribution after college when we follow them over time using tax data. And what you can see is a lot of the colleges you might be familiar with, you know, places like Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and so on, look terrific on that measure. The low-income kids who go to those colleges reach the upper middle class or beyond and, and do very well. But of course, what matters for a college's contribution to economic mobility is not just how well the low-income students do, but how many low-income students you have on campus to begin with. And on that dimension, you can see that you know, Harvard, for example, has only 3% of kids coming from the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Another statistic that gives you the picture is you're about 80 times more likely to attend Harvard if you're from a family making more than $700,000 a year, which puts you in the top 1% relative to the bottom 20% of the income distribution. 
So when you have that kind of input into an institution, obviously Harvard cannot be contributing a whole lot to, to economic mobility. On the other end of the spectrum, you have many colleges here that are serving many low-income kids, but don't have great outcomes. And so they also don't contribute a whole lot to economic mobility for a different reason. So conceptually, you know, one way to think about the problem in the higher education system is that you don't have a lot of dots in the upper right side here. You don't have a lot of colleges that are serving many low-income kids and have good outcomes. And so a, a key challenge, I think, going forward is how do you move these dots to the right and how do you move those dots up? And so that's a way we're thinking about you know, making progress in this literature, and we'll have a paper on the first one of those points out later this summer, and I think we'll see more work in that area. Once again, let me point out that this is not unique to the US. There's been some nice work done analogously here in the, in the UK by Neil Shepard and colleagues who was at uh, Oxford and is now my colleague at Harvard. Again, there's some data limitations in the UK, and you can't replicate exactly what we did in the US. But you see broadly the same picture. I will note that you know, LSE uh, is an exception to the, to the trend. So interested in understanding what you all are doing here, but that's, uh, that's terrific. Um, but you know, broadly, I think there's a very similar issue. You know, places like Oxford and Cambridge basically look like Harvard and Princeton and so on. So uh, let me end by just you know, noting some limitations of what I've shown you and suggesting some directions for further work. You know, I think doing more work studying mechanisms, trying to develop new positive models that fit the partial equilibrium evidence that I've shown here, thinking about general equilibrium considerations more systematically, and also thinking about these issues from a normative perspective, going back to the roots of public finance, Merlesian type of models, thinking about equality of opportunity more systematically, would all be very, very valuable directions for further work. And I'll note, you know, especially recognizing that people come from many different uh, countries here, I think it'd be very useful to study these issues in other countries as well as people are starting to do, um, not just in the developed world, right? So I think there's really creative work that people have done in places like African countries, in India, uh, which is of personal relevance to me. So, you know, my own parents come from very low income families in the southern tip of India, which you can see happens to be in the darkest green colors, one of the places with the highest levels of upward mobility in India. I've often wondered myself, you know, why I've had the opportunities I've had, and I think, you know, that is, is uh, part of the reason. So thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Raj, for this inspiring lecture. We're now going to take uh, questions from the audience and again from the uh, uh, people online. Again, the rules of the game, raise your hand. I'm going to try to collect uh, probably like two, three questions in a row. Uh, and let me remind you to try to be concise, OK, in your questions. OK, let's start maybe with uh, the person with the yellow uh, on the Hello. left. Hi, uh, my name is Luisa. I used to be a teaching assistant for a very working class school here in London. Um, after your presentation, I cannot, uh, I have to wonder that if like it's a jobs that are typically done by working class families like bus drivers, uh, teachers, um, yeah, policemen, um, just having like decent wages for those jobs will help if that it's something that you have thought about. Because these are like the jobs that the children that I work with mm -hmm. are going to end up doing probably. Excellent, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, maybe in the back with the hat. Hello, thank you for an exceptional presentation. My question was about uh, the experimental study that you're doing about moving to mobility. I was wondering if you measured any socio-emotional sort of index, the impact of movement. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And maybe one last question uh, while you're at it, uh, all the way up to uh, the lady on the right here. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm a master's student in economics at the LSE. Uh, you mostly talked about um, impacting the economic uh, 
connectedness in different societies to impact the upward mobility. But I was wondering if studying the mechanism underlying the, through which how um, economic connectedness impacts um, the upward mobility. Like if instead of changing the economic connectedness, like if we study the mechanism between those two variables, maybe we could come up with better policies. And I was wondering how important that question is yeah. or like if it's possible to come up with an answer yeah. for that. Great, yeah, well thank you for those questions, all excellent questions. Let me maybe take them in reverse order. So on the issue of mechanisms underlying economic connectedness, I totally agree, you know, some of the things that I was enumerating that maybe it's about referrals or maybe it's about changes in aspiration or changes in the information that people have. If we can understand which of those is actually at play and we're trying to do some quasi-experimental work with the Facebook microdata, trying to piece that apart at the moment, you're exactly right that in principle one wouldn't then need to actually address economic connectedness itself. If you find out, for example, that it's about a lack of information, you know, maybe you can address that directly. My instinct from other settings, like the Seattle experiment that I was talking about, is the simple things you might think of, the low-cost things like providing information. We've seen this in many different contexts. They don't really move the needle that much. You need something that's much higher touch. So it's possible that certain types of mentoring programs could make a difference, or uh, you know, having role models of certain types could make a difference. Uh, I think it remains to be seen how scalable that is, but I, you know, I totally agree with you that doing more work in that space would be very valuable. Um, on the question of subjective well-being and mental health impacts of moving to opportunity, so in the Seattle study, we do a little bit of that work, but I would actually refer you to an earlier body of research looking at the original moving to opportunity experiment, which required that people move to lower poverty areas to get vouchers in the treatment group. And the interesting finding there is, you know, our reanalysis of that data, as I showed briefly, shows that kids' economic outcomes improved in the long run. But there's some earlier work by my colleague Larry Katz and others, which shows that the mental health, uh, both as measured by subjective self-reports, as well as measures of clinical depression, for example, by doctors, show significant improvements for the adults when they move to these higher opportunity areas. So you might have worried, you know, that people feel out of place and they're in you know, this different environment, the kids do better, but it creates a lot of stress for the parents. But actually it turns out empirically, the parents seem much happier. And maybe the simplest economic measure of that, the way we would think about it in economics, is just revealed preference. You know, in the Seattle data, we see that the families who we help supported in moving to a high opportunity area, three years later are very likely, 95% of them are staying and renewing their lease in the high opportunity places. They don't want to leave and they seem very happy when you look at subjective self-report. So I don't think there's a concern on that front. In fact, I think there may be an improvement to be had. Um, and then finally, coming to the question on you know, wages of jobs, you're absolutely right that if we could change the wage distribution, that would also uh, have an impact on issues of inequality. Reframing your question slightly, you know, I focused in this lecture specifically on issues of social mobility and equality of opportunity as opposed to a redistribution approach which is another way to tackle inequality and of course can also make sense. So why should we be interested in social mobility? It connects, I think, to some of the normative questions that I was mentioning at the end where my sense is many people care about equality of opportunity, just independent of equality of outcomes across the political spectrum. But also from a more practical perspective, I think there's a fiscal argument to care about social mobility where if you can change the dynamics of income, where people are more likely to rise up across generations, then the need for making repeated transfers in subsequent generations or having interventions like the minimum wage and so on might be reduced in subsequent generations, which might be fiscally more tenable. So this is not to say that redistribution should not be considered. Obviously, you know, reducing inequality in that way could be very valuable, but I think focusing on social mobility in addition, as I've done here, is also independently a useful thing to think about. Excellent. I saw many questions in the middle, but I think we should also address some questions from uh, the online audience, if you don't mind. And I'm going to turn to Mary, who has the immense responsibility of picking three interesting questions. So far, we have two. Um, okay. One, that's fine, that's fine. We'll start one is two. from Abigail McKnight, who's the director of the Center of Analysis of Social Exclusion at LSE. 
And Abigail asks, um, she says, one of the most powerful charts shown was the overlap between race and economic mobility, um, highlighting much lower opportunities for black men. Why did you not consider a policy specifically focused on trying to improve opportunities for young black men? And we also have a question from Julia Wodinska, who asks, uh, what kind of research about the influence of schools on social mobility do you think we're missing? Yeah. Um, great, so let me start with the first one there on race and economic mobility, which I absolutely agree, you know, understanding what's going on with black men and trying to improve opportunities for black youth in the US and possibly elsewhere is, is extremely important. Um, and so, you know, some of our ongoing work focuses on exactly that issue, trying to understand where we can make progress. What, there's certain areas where we're seeing outcomes improving for black men. Why is that happening? What does that imply for policy? Let me point out a few patterns that we've seen in the data that I think are relevant for thinking about this. So one pattern we note is that measures of discrimination are strongly correlated with these differences in economic mobility for black men. So how can you measure dis discrimination systematically across areas? There are a couple different ways you might think about it. One is uh, to use measures of explicit racial animus from things like Google searches. So there's a former student of ours, Seth Stevens Davidovitz, who's constructed an index of racial animus, where he basically uses Google search data for racial epithets and is able to construct that by uh, area in the US. And we see that in places with more racial animus, more searches for racial epithets, you tend to see lower levels of economic mobility for black men. There are also measures of implicit racial bias from the social psychology literature, where you look at reaction times, and it's a way to measure implicit bias. And again, you see that places with higher implicit bias among whites tend to have lower mobility for black men. So that suggests, and here I don't think we have clear interventions yet, but that suggests that trying to address discrimination in some way could potentially matter for uh, black men's opportunities. But there's another dimension as well, which is coming back to what I was saying on social capital and who people are influenced by, who they're connected to, we find a very strong pattern that black men tend to have better outcomes in areas where there are more black employed fathers who are present. So there's a phenomenon, as some of you might know, of missing black men in the US due to very high rates of incarceration or even premature death. And in communities where that's prevalent, we tend to see that black boys have much worse outcomes, but black girls actually have no different outcomes. And that's consistent with an emerging literature that the presence of male role models in a community matters particularly for boys' outcomes. And so that's another area where you might think about uh, programs, for instance, there's a program called Becoming a Man, which is an intervention trying to provide essentially social support and mentoring to youth who are at risk of getting incarcerated that has shown very positive treatment effects, Jens Ludwig and other co-authors at the University of Chicago. So I think there are a number of things that could be done, but again, like I was saying with the place-based interventions, I don't think we have a completely clear understanding of exactly what matters on that dimension. More quickly, on the role of schools and economic mobility, you know, I think there are numerous interventions that can matter. I was showing some things in the context of integration and connectedness. You know, separately, I think there's clear evidence from a number of literatures that, uh, the effectiveness of teachers, the size of classrooms, um, certain charter schools, the, the quality of instruction can matter a great deal for student outcomes in the long run, and I think all of those are domains we should be focused on as well. Great, thanks a lot. So, I'm going to be honest with you, we have five minutes, so I'm, I'm going to disappoint some of you, but we're going to collect maybe three, four questions from the middle, uh, if you don't mind. So, maybe uh, you two in the middle, uh, we're going to need to have someone get to you first, and then we're going to collect as many questions as we can in that little pocket over there. Yeah, um, I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to try to be quick. Um, basically, um, I'm also an American. Um, I'm from California. You're from Boston. I couldn't help but realize in, the, in one of the maps, specifically regarding the southeastern United States, <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot of diversity in the north, in the west. There are major black communities in California throughout the northern United States, throughout the United States, but specifically regarding the severity of the racial discrimination and, and a lot of the wealth gaps in the southeastern United States. I was wondering beyond just sort of 
the lenses which you looked at in the research that you've been doing, as someone who is an expert and as someone who is in the thick of this research, I am wondering if you have kind of done, it, this is hard to measure, but like a dive into sort of the social psychology of regions. Because especially when you look at some of the legislation, some of the political rhetoric coming out of these areas, there's a really strong kind of regional cultural dynamic regarding the southeastern United States in particular. Um, and especially regarding home ownership, concepts like white flight. Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to know what you thought of that in terms of basically, I would call it institutional friending bias. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at places like Roswell in the north of Atlanta mm -hmm. and places across mm -hmm. the south that look like that where basically mm -hmm. entire white communities leave mm -hmm. intentionally and create their own wealth mm -hmm. bubbles in a way that's much more extreme than other parts mm -hmm. of the United States. Um, how would you what, do you, what do you say to that? Great, thank you. Well, yeah. Great, uh, thank you very much, Professor Chetty. I'm uh, very much inspired by the work you've done. My PhD uh, research focuses on the impact of urban apartheid uh, segregation legislation on long run health outcomes. And in a very similar vein, I was curious, to what degree can your work, or at least your approach, begin to think about the historical origins of why there are certain zones that have low mobility mm -hmm. versus high mobility? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Now you've got five or ten years more data since you started this research. How sticky are you finding yeah. these changes on social yeah. mobility between generations? Great, and maybe one last question. I'm so sorry, it's very tough. Uh, Mr. Great right here. I was surprised in your, uh, the activities you're doing in Seattle that only 50%, around 50% of the people from the low mobility neighborhoods chose to move into mm -hmm. the high mobility neighborhoods. What do you think that says about the unwillingness of a lot of people, people in America to move out of like uh, areas that are deprived areas into, into more yeah. up and coming areas. Yeah, thanks. So great questions. I'll, I'll try to maybe address them um, in, in a couple groups. So there are a couple questions basically about time series variation, historical variation you asked about, and you said you know 15 years of data. What do we see now in terms of how sticky things are? Um, so that's exactly, you know, I think an incredibly useful way to look at this. I've basically shown you in this talk, a snapshot, as you noticed, for a single generation. To learn more, it'd be great if we could start to see which places are getting better, which places are getting worse, how sticky are these things. So the other paper, I mentioned this paper on colleges that we'll be putting out this summer, the other paper focuses now with 15 years of data, looking at what happens, how have outcomes changed in particular by race and by class. And we are actually, to my surprise, seeing quite significant changes. So just to give you the quick tagline, the title of that paper is Shrinking Race Gaps, Growing Class Gaps. We're finding a narrowing of the black-white gap among low-income people and an expansion of the class gap. So whether you're born to lower high-income parents as a white person is starting to matter more and more in America. And there's a narrowing uh, between blacks and whites at the bottom of the distribution. And we've done a bunch of work, which you'll see in this paper if you're interested, um, on why that is, and it relates to some of these sociological mechanisms that I've been emphasizing here. Similarly, you know, with an even broader lens, we're working with the Census Bureau on digitizing information from tapes so that we'll have a full panel of everyone in the United States from 1940 to 2020. And that will permit, you know, incredibly rich analysis that will, will be available to many different researchers and you can look at an enormous variety of interesting things from a historical point of view, right? Civil rights legislation, you know, many other things, and understand the broad scope of how these things change over time. On the issue of the South, and that relates to institutional factors, you know, I totally agree with you. You might have noticed in some of those maps, if there, there, there are these maps that people have constructed overlaying our data on where the plantations were, where slavery was most prevalent, you can see an incredibly strong relationship there. And so I think you're quite right that some of these institutions persist and lead to segregation that persists across generations, ends up affecting black Americans, but I would also emphasize ends up affecting low-income white Americans because they also get excluded from many resources that can be an integration that can be valuable for upward mobility. On that subject, I would refer you to uh, work of another former student, Elora 
Duran Ancord, who's a professor at Princeton, who's done some very nice work on migration patterns and why we're seeing different things in the South and how that's changed over time and so forth. And then finally, to conclude on the question about you know, why people are not moving. So I'll say two things there. So one thing I think I've learned from the Seattle work and other related work is usually in neoclassical economics, our model is that people are going to optimize and pick you know, the best, the utility maximizing place. And that's fundamental in many aspects of economics, including in models of spatial equilibrium and dynamics and so on. And I think what you see quite clearly in that data is providing people a little bit of support, not fundamentally changing you know, the value of going to one place versus another, moves a big chunk of people, goes from 14% to 55%, choosing to live in very different neighborhoods. So what that suggests to me is that neoclassical view that you know, everybody is optimizing in that way in the context of neighborhood choice, school choice, you know, many other choices may not be right, and we need to think hard about what that means in terms of the types of interventions that would be desirable. But another aspect of your question is that I emphasize the positive 55% who chose to move to opportunity. There's another 45%, obviously, who, even despite the assistance we gave, chose not to move. So who are those people? So we've done some sociological work trying to talk to these families, understand what's going on. Let me give you an example that I think captures the point. There's a big Ethiopian community in Seattle, and there are a number of families from that community who said, you know, it may well be that you see on average in the data uh, children do better in this neighborhood, but you know I'm much more comfortable with my community here, and I don't want to move. So that, that makes perfect sense. I think that can be rationalized with preferences. And so my view is that rather than mandating that people have to live in certain places or building housing in certain places, enabling choice, as we're trying to do with the Seattle work and these bills that are being passed in the US, so everyone can make the best choices given their preferences, can basically express their preferences effectively. Uh, would be a very valuable way to, to go forward. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your attending this Moishima lecture and uh, for your questions. Uh, I think you're all going to join me in thanking very warmly Raj for sharing his uh, opportunity insights with us.